Okay. Thank you, everyone, to show up for this meeting so late in the day. I know it's uh, getting harder and harder to concentrate as, uh, as time moves on. So let's talk about how obsolete is your cloud. I get that question time and again uh, when I do assessments for customers. But before we do, let's just, um, if somebody wants to take a picture of this uh, QR code, um, that would be, I'll leave it up for, for a minute or so. So about myself, I'm Christian Hübner. I am uh, principal architect at Mirantis for services. I do storage and infrastructure as my main uh, topic, which uh, obviously makes this uh, talk somewhere in the, inside the core of uh, what I do in my day-to-day -day work. And I've been with Mirantis for a little bit more than nine years. I've seen everything OpenStack. I've seen a lot of technological development. Okay. And uh, it never really stops. So a lot of customers have built on one OpenStack platform and next OpenStack platform. And the question that is always comes back is, should we buy some new hardware? Should we upgrade what we currently have? Should we uh, build a hybrid middle of that? So let's have a look at that for today. So I invented a, a non-existing company because I do not really want to uh, put anyone who actually exists in there. So uh, the idea is we look at an environment that has been created about five, six years ago on the heyday of the Xeon E5 series and see what of the hardware is still applicable for today, what needs to be upgraded, and uh, how uh, you can decide what, uh, what solution is best for you. So this is what a cloud back then used to look like. You have controllers, typically something relatively low power. The clouds were not really all that big. Um, it's uh, uh, like five, six years ago. Um, you had typically hard disks for pretty much everything, except for Ceph. We had, uh, needed journal SSDs, with, uh, that, which was always uh, a discussion. Can we make them a little bit smaller? Because SSDs are so unbelievably expensive back then, of course. Then we have compute nodes with what was, uh, for the longest time, was the most cost-efficient uh, processor that you could buy, the uh, 2650 V4. Some memory, again, hard disks for the boot, and a storage subsystem that uses also entirely hard disks, two U chassis, 20 times two terabyte uh, uh, SSDs, uh, uh, 20 times uh, 2 terabyte uh, hard disks, and 4 times 240 gigabyte SSD. This was big enough for back then for, uh, to run the journals on the Ceph cluster. And of course, it's all uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet throughout, because back then, uh, faster Ethernet was really very expensive. So what, have, what do we have at workloads? Um, normally, you have like a wide vari variety of workloads. So I uh, add up what's there and divide by the number of workloads, so I get an average workload, so we can have a, a basis to calcul uh, calculate on. So let's say we have four uh, v cores, 400 gigabytes of memory, and 100 gigabytes of storage. This would be probably a mix of some, uh, a lot of uh, Linux workloads and a few Windows workloads thrown in that need a lot more storage. And let's say in our case, we also have what was fairly typical back then, no failure domains defined, so basically everything's just one soup of compute nodes and storage nodes. And of course, after these five or six years, your cloud has filled up to almost capacity, uh, both from a performance standpoint and a capacity standpoint. So uh, you have to look at what you can do to make this cloud uh, come, drag this cloud uh, kicking and screaming into 2022. So, first, I hear time and again, it still runs. Yes, it does. It's slow. You have uh, typically complaints. Uh, you do not, we do not have enough IOPS. We have tried to run databases on hard disks with uh, uh, 
some journaling thrown in, and of obviously the performance was not quite where we wanted it to be. So, uh, but a lot of things have changed uh, in the meantime. First of all, monitoring, monitoring and alerting originally worked fairly okay with hard disk, but uh, the amount of uh, monitoring, at least the data that at least we collected, was um, relatively small, and it has grown significantly and also to the point where it's simply not fast enough to write to those hard disks anymore. So first thing that you need to do is, for, uh, if you were to uh, keep your old hardware, would be to add SSDs to your control plane nodes so you would be able to actually monitor the whole thing. Second thing is, system devices should be SSD. This is uh, also something that has initially, uh, everyone says, yeah, it boots, it boots fine from hard disk. But uh, for the, the downtimes needed, and especially if you do something like an upgrade or where you have a lot of nodes that need to be rebooted, you will figure out that uh, the performance of a hard disk is really hampering you at the time that it takes for nodes to come online again. So you have longer maintenance windows. You have, uh, and uh, overall, it is, uh, it's miserable trying to get uh, all those nodes um, upgraded and, and rebooted and everything. Next thing, of course, is that the applications that were written five, six, seven years ago were less uh, I.O. hungry than uh, the, one, uh, the applications that you have today. You have a, a never-ending deluge of uh, data rolling in, and you have to have something that you actually uh, need to store on. And then uh, also we have had some technical changes. One of them is one ma major one that you probably, a lot of you have already seen, is that uh, since Ceph Luminous, we have switched from file store to blue store, which has changed the hardware requirements that were never, uh, for the Ceph cluster. Uh, one more thing, of course, as we had a cloud with that has no failure domains, so we have, to, we have to actually rebuild it with the proper failure domain separation, or we should re rebuild it with the proper failure domain separation, which is kind of problematic if you try to do that with a cloud that already exists. Um, especially if you do this with a Ceph cluster, you say, okay, I have a soup of Ceph nodes, and now I suddenly separate those into three racks, then an enormous amount of data is going to start to move. So you will eventually, uh, it, will, it will take quite a while. And as your source, uh, source disks and destination disks, in this case, if, if we were to uh, keep your hard disk-based uh, cluster, this is going to take a very long time. Just as an illustration, we had this uh, at a customer who, who tried to both um, rebuild as one of those 20 node uh, two terabyte servers and a server that was SSD-based. The SSD-based server rebuilt took I think it was about 40 minutes or an hour uh, to, uh, to rebuild the uh, OSD server in there. The, um, th that hard disk space server was, uh, was um, not, still not rebuilt after four days. So, and there's one final point. If you were to put new nodes into your existing cloud, you cannot buy the same nodes anymore that you had uh, like five or six years ago, because nobody is selling uh, nodes with these CPUs anymore. What you can obviously do, especially for compute nodes, is find something that is from a, from a performance profile fairly similar and, and just uh, stuff it in. But uh, it is not an optimal solution. So we have. Technically, we have three options. I only put two on the slides. Uh, one of them is uh, we simply stay with what we have and live with whatever is uh, in there. It's cheap. You can just do upgrade OpenStack. You deal with uh, performance issues. You still have no uh, failure domains properly set up. Um, but uh, it will, uh, you will not have to migrate workloads, which in itself is some effort. The second solution is the exact op uh, opposite of that. You buy all new environment, migrate your applications, and you uh, can build, the, uh, build the, cloud, the new cloud just as you want it. You do not have a time pressure on it because you, have, uh, you are building a new environment while the old one is still running. And then you migrate everything bit by bit over there. Downside is it costs money. The other thing is workload migration is required. We have some customers who have workloads that can be migrated very easily because they are short-lived. 
but uh, other customers have uh, workloads that have long runners that, uh, that run months or longer. So uh, you may have to drag some data, some applications from your old cloud into the new one. You cannot just migrate by attrition. And then um, finally, of course, uh, your CFO is going to tell you, hey, I bought this thing only six years ago. Um, why, why do you already want new hardware? But uh, well, that's what we're looking at. And then there's the third option, which would be to use some of the components from the old cluster and build uh, a new cluster around it. One of the potential uh, candidates would be to just reuse the compute nodes, pull them out, uh, stuff SSDs into them, and, and uh, rebuild them. Um, the Ceph cluster, not so much. We'll come to that in a minute. But uh, the, um, I would pers personally say this kind of combines the disadvantages of both solutions. You still have to uh, migrate some of your, or you have to re rebuild some of your uh, environment. And you, uh, it is still going to cost quite a bit of money to do this. And it makes, potentially makes more sense to actually build uh, something entirely new. So time flies. What has changed? If you look at CPUs that were in the servers about what, five, six years ago, like the 2650 that I was talking about, these were relatively old-style CPUs. Intel had no competition. They built basically what they just, just what they wanted. And the progress was relatively slow. If you see uh, E5, V2, 1, V2, V3, V4, it was always just a little bit of an incremental uh, build. Then AMD showed up on the scene with the EPIC CPUs, and all of a sudden, Intel was not so happy anymore because the performance was, uh, of the AMD CPUs was dramatically faster. What did they do? They also made their CPUs, or they, they pushed their CPU boundaries, and they were quite successfully, actually. So if you look at Xeon Silver 4310, which is a literally the, the, the bottom end of what I consider a professional commercial uh, grade CPU. Xeon bronzes are not really something that I would put in a server that I run. But this is sort of the cheapest cheap CPU that Intel sells. It's about 50% faster by benchmarking than an E5 2699V4, which was back then a $9,000 CPU. Memory cost has also gone down quite considerably. And one of the most important changes was that um, for 25 gigabit Ethernet is pretty much the norm these days. So uh, the network bottlenecking that we did see quite a bit in, uh, in 10 gigabit uh, environments, especially with SSDs, is sort of a thing of the past. You can also go faster, and the cost is, cost is not so egregious that it's not possible. But in most cases, um, building servers are so large that they are not Run, uh, runnable with 25 gigabit Ethernet is actually creating another set of problems around um, packing too many workloads into one server. That uh, you late, uh, so if you have um, too few compute nodes to, uh, with, with uh, too many workloads in them, then failure of a single compute node will impact your environment uh, a lot. So this is something that you also probably should uh, think about avoiding. And of course, hard disks are almost completely obsolete. If you build a self cluster from those two terabyte hard disks with the appropriate SSD th uh, thrown in, it's not really going to be that much cheaper than a, th than a, a cluster that is all SSD, I mean, within 10% or so. So let's look at the modern configuration. Control plane nodes, they can, this is one thing that I um, lately uh, have been specking more, is a single CPU system, so, we do, so you do not have NUMA lag. You don't have um, network cards attached to one or the other CPU. The worst, con the first, worst offender on this is, by the way, Ceph, not, uh, not the control plane, because um, worst case, you use NVMe. NVMe devices attached to a different CPU than the network card. So you are basically bouncing back and forth NUMA lag, uh, and uh, you will see this in the, uh, in the latency of the system. So. Compute nodes, these are a relatively cheap CPUs, make for cheap compute nodes. They are still, from a performance standpoint, better, what, better than what you um, had in your old system.
you would have about 30 compute nodes to get the same performance profile that you would get out of the 50 compute nodes with the old CPUs. Um, maybe 25. Uh, one of the um, bottlenecks, or one, one of the reasons why I don't want to go much farther with the CPU is if I have to pump up the memory too much, um, you're getting from this more or less flat thing with 8, 16, 32. Uh, gigabyte memory modules, if you go, to go higher to 128 gigabytes, for instance, they are com considerably more expensive than the, uh, than the smaller memory modules are. So keep the nodes in the middle. You could compact this whole thing into an iNode cluster if you really wanted to um, stuff a, a, a couple of Intel, of uh, AMD Epic 64-core CPUs in there, and it works. The downside to it is, again, if one of these things fails, then you are going to be in hot water. And then we have 18 storage nodes, which are uh, using also, again, a single CPU. Something, uh, if you are buying something with high core count, uh, at the moment AMD is uh, superior to Intel. Um, Intel tops out at, what's that, 36 cores right now. AMD goes all the way up to 64 cores, cores per CPU, so if, uh, this is a, a, something that uh, should be considered. Um, and we have... Uh, I've, I did comparison for a number of customers lately. Um, NVMe is simply um, at the same price point now where uh, that um, uh, SaaS SSDs are. So uh, I uh, tell customers to just skip uh, SaaS SSD. Um, for, I mean, most of you probably know, but for everyone who does not know what the difference between NVMe and SaaS or SATA SSDs is, the uh, NVMe is directly connected to the CPU via the PCI Express bus, so basically the CPU uh, writes directly to the um, to the drive. Whereas in a SATA uh, in the SATA bus, the CPU um, sends this to the SATA controller. The SATA controller flips from a um, from a disk from a memory access protocol to disk access protocol, pushes the data into the disk, and the disk itself flips it uh, flips it back, and then you do the same thing back on the way out. So the uh, limitations of a um, uh, of a SATA SSD, about 500 megabyte per second, newest generation NVMe can do five and a half gigabyte per second. So it does not really make sense to save a few percent there. You will certainly find that um, you can never really have too much performance for the same amount of money. So now the question is, what do we do? Buy, do we buy, do we not buy? If your cloud is still uh, not fully loaded, you can try to uh, uh, just patch it and uh, upgrade what, uh, what you have. But in most cases at the moment, uh, if I was to, to build something new, I would want th something that is state of the art in every respect, that is fully tested, that is fully built. And I do not want to sit there uh, in a bunch of maintenance windows at night trying to, to sub substitute compute nodes, old compute nodes for new compute nodes, or even worse, old storage nodes for new storage nodes. So in many cases, it's simply uh, is the better choice to buy, uh, but this is in the end, it, uh, it all, it's all up to you because you are the ones in your company who know most about this, uh, and you are the ones who are advising the uh, management and, uh, and your peers on what, uh, what should be done. So um, look at what's available, uh, make a plan, decide what you, what you would like to do, and then Go to management, tell them, okay, this is the, this is the solution that I will uh, that I want. In the end, the summary of the of all this is, technology really has moved on in the last five years more than more so than in the ten years before, and uh, what you currently can get, especially on the storage side, is simply uh, is simply on the way, uh, is simply not in, not in the same performance realm anymore. So, and the question is now you have a whole bunch of nodes lying around, what do you do with them? One of them, the very first thing that I would do is if you do not already have that is build a staging cloud. Build something that is small but looks exactly like the staging, like the cloud that you have. Um, ideally, you have enough compute nodes to build failure domains. Ideally, you have enough self nodes to build uh, failure domains and like th um, three compute nodes, six self nodes. 
and a control plane on top of that, and test everything that you want to do with the new cloud on that staging cloud. If you, uh, if you have a staging cloud, the operational risk of your cloud goes down more than half. Um, you, can, you could uh, make a whole bunch of developers really happy by building a lab or test or dev system with a, um, that has lower demands on uh, the system itself, and that also uh, where you do really not have that much of a problem with, uh, with something that is not entirely optimal. Um, so you would be able to um, build software uh, properly and then uh, only deploy it on the main system with, uh, once you have, have tested it. If you do that with a proper uh, CI-CD system or any kind of uh, automated uh, software delivery mecha uh, mechanism, then you're also going to, uh, op to cut your operational risk by, let's say, half, because, simply because uh, you do not, uh, testing in production uh, always has the risk associated with it that something goes horribly wrong, and then you are going to be the one who, sh who shows up at 3 in the morning trying to fix this thing. Finally, there's always trade-in programs. Unfortunately, servers from five years, six years ago, for good reason, do not fetch a lot of money anymore, but at least they will get properly uh, recycled. So, um, from my point of view, this is uh, the end of the session. From your point of view, it's more of the beginning to uh, think about what you are going to do on your next upgrade cycle, how you are going to ideally uh, address the problems that you are going to face. And I hope that this session has brought you some insight into what to think about when you are building uh, a new environment or when you are um, uh, upgrading from one OpenStack version to another, from the building, uh, rebuilding something old that you have. So uh, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of the show.